Tony Hops must be stopped. That's just Brandon talking right there. <laughs> I'm channeling Brandon Mitchell. Brandon Johnson. Was that not on purpose? I know. It was not. On... <laughs> wow. It happened again. Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I will be joined by Brian Mitchell so we can share our experiences with Westworld Season 2. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO44. So, before we get into Westworld stuff, uh, I got a couple of kind of um, housekeeping things to, to talk about. Um, one is uh, a previous episode of Second Opinion, um, I believe this was like four weeks ago, uh, was about um, an app, Run an Empire, uh, and there have been significant updates to that app since then. So if you listen to that episode um, and you want to you know, hear about how it's changed, uh, go back and re-listen to that episode. Uh, I've updated the MP3 file for that. Um, the other housekeeping thing is uh, if you came here and you are worried about spoilers, uh, don't worry, we'll have a spoiler-free section uh, here at the beginning for season two, um, and we will let you know, uh, and we'll have like a little musical interlude or something before we get into the spoilers for season two. However, we will be spoiling season one. So if you have not seen season one of Westworld, don't listen to this one. Uh, go back and listen to our review of season one of Westworld, which was second opinion number 17. Uh, and you can find the link to that in the show notes here. Hi, Brian here. Um, I would also recommend just watching the whole season instead of just listen listening to the review. It's much better oh, than our review. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, I did enjoy that review a lot. Uh, and I wasn't even on it. I think that's one of my favorite reviews. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I got really, really lucky because I edited that episode, so I, I couldn't avoid, you know, the spoilers that you guys talked about in that episode. Um, but by the time I got around to watching season one of Westworld, I had managed to completely forget about anything that you guys talked about. So <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Other than the fact that it was a really good show. That's what I remembered. Okay. Good. Yeah. That's what's important. So here for season two... Um, I, I watched it in a very different way than I watched season one. Um, we, well, for one thing, we were watching it like as the episodes were coming out. Uh, so one per week. Um, with season one, I think I was binge watching it with, uh, with my housemates. And, uh, and I definitely recommend kind of taking your time with this uh, instead of like binge watching it. Um, I find that it's really nice to like, to, to find a good episode by episode recap analysis type podcast, you know, uh, so, and, and that kind of forces you naturally to instead of going from one episode to the next of the TV show, you have to wait until you've listened to the podcast episode that had to do with that episode before you go on to the next TV episode. Um, and so, yeah, it just it like forces you to like think about everything at least twice before you actually uh, move on. So yeah, and I, yeah. So I watched episode or season one, about an episode, you know, sometimes an episode every couple of days. Maybe I watched mm -hmm. two episodes in one day once, and yeah. But I I watched the entire show over a course of a week and a half, so I averaged probably about an episode a day, and mm -hmm. this time through, averaging you know, always seeing one episode a week, I thought it was a little too spaced out. I was starting to forget the small little things because I was I was really good about keeping up on that while watching season one. And mm -hmm. I missed out on that a bit. I did not listen to reviews, podcast or anything. Maybe that would have been different. But I did spend a lot of time reading about things on Reddit. So mm -hmm. that kind of fills the podcast gap, at least. Yeah. And the podcast that I was listening to um, was drawing pretty heavily f from Reddit uh, to find, like, theories. Um, because the it wasn't like a, a, a recap, like a shot-by-shot -shot recap uh, podcast they were literally talking about fan theories about Westworld um, yeah and that and that podcast is uh, called out West for anybody who's interested so I think one of one of my favorite things about Westworld both season one and season two has been the music um, I think it's been very like phenomenal um, 
the original soundtrack didn't really arrest me in season two as much as season one did. Um, but uh, earlier today, I was actually listening to uh, the the whole soundtrack for for season two, and and like the songs are like hold up on their own. Um, I guess for some reason, I just didn't notice them as much while I was watching the show. Mm-hmm. Um, the times that I did rec- like notice them was you know when they were like either using some part of the soundtrack that appeared in uh, season one. Um, or when they were doing things like um, their their theme of like taking classic rock songs and then u- making instrumental versions of them uh, to use in the show, They're, they continue that in season two, um, and I and I still love it. It's just as good the second time, especially um, especially when they redid uh, Paint It Black, um, and they they incorporated like a new style of it to kind of match with like what they were going for in that scene um and i thought i thought that was that was really masterful and the uh the composer of the the score there uh ramen Mm -hmm. uh geez how do i pronounce his last name i would i would guess ramin jawadi yeah sounds good he made a a cameo appearance in one of the episodes so that was pretty nice really Um, i'll have to go i think he was actually playing guitar in or outside of a saloon in uh whose town was it um was it in sweetwater or was it in one of the other no it was the other town it was um who's the man oh gosh see this is what happens when you don't watch the episodes soon enough um the (laughs) the man who was going around with the man in black lawrence lawrence yes lawrence's town okay it was okay in that town uh ramen was sitting and playing guitar that's awesome that's awesome yeah and I I'm not one who is very knowledgeable about classic rock songs. So like none of none of the songs that they've used in the show have been ones that I like recognized on their own, you know? But I have started to be able to recognize when they're doing that, when you know, when a song that's appearing in the show is based on a classic rock song uh just by the way that it's like like stylistically very different from yeah. the rest of the soundtrack yeah um and i think the, the one that i noticed uh specifically was um um something about a heart um what's it called <laughs> i don't i have not listened to season two soundtrack at all yet i probably should have but I, there are many common songs you've heard from season one uh maybe heart shaped box yep. that's what it's called. yeah that was from the trailer I've listened to that one several times. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, this, of course, is a show that has a lot of questions that it leaves us with. Um, and season two gave us a lot of answers to those questions, I think, that they left us hanging with in season one. Uh, but they always did it in ways that, like, left us feeling, you know, that we were, like, waiting for answers to other questions as well. Um which made it, it felt a little frustrating, but like at the same time, now that I look back on it, it's like okay, no, they they were actually, you know, it, it's not like they were keeping us in the dark about everything. They were they were feeding us new information as time went on. Um, I feel like this season was more following the characters and exploring. Okay, I'll talk about this in uh spoiler in spoiler section. Mm-hmm. So, uh, stay tuned, listener. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. One thing that um, that's similar to season one, of course, is that we have uh, we're still dealing with like multiple different timelines that are being interspersed, you know, in with each other in ways that that we don't like. They they don't make it clear how they connect to each other. Um, but at least you know since since we already saw that happening in season 1 it became pretty apparent pretty quickly in season 2 that that was the case that we were seeing multiple different timelines um i think especially in season 1 or episode 1 of this of season 2 uh-huh. there was uh, a scene that was totally just playing up reddit and over analyzing the multiple timeline thing <laughs> um it ended up being pretty much unrelevant but Okay. There are little, there are little okay. things there that at least Reddit saw that was yeah you know, m- maybe it was an accident with filming, but maybe not. I don't know. People overanalyzed yeah. it though, it's <laughs> myself included. 
Oh, if I was making a, a show like this, I would definitely put in some red herrings. Yeah, definitely. Th- those are very important to have. Um, they, I mean, by by this time, by season two, the 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 show has pretty well established how they view and treat consciousness but they still had some pretty unique things to say about it in in season two you know um both on the the subject of consciousness but also like like personhood you know who what 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 makes a person um which is always always a theme in you know these uh artistic works that have to do with like artificial intelligence and whatnot yeah i feel like you know in any science fiction show the the biggest themes are that of humanity. It's like yeah. science fiction is just a way of looking back on yourself rather than exploring something purely technical and not, you know, not related to you at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the problems that I had with this season, especially is like, because of the nature of the show itself, uh, any time that they like revealed something it didn't really feel like it had much significance because like the showrunners could easily walk it back and say like oh yep nope that was just like a host misremembering this or like it was a simulation of something and um you know so i like as a as a viewer i always like i didn't feel like i was on my toes because i never knew what i knew you know what i mean yep i would say season one was more captivating to me there was a more although the multiple timelines was timelines was a little confusing and i didn't really understand that mm-hmm. fully at least while watching it well, i was it and, yeah drew me and in. they also didn't they didn't reveal that it was multiple timelines until like three quarters of the way through the show right yep yeah but it it, it drew me in it had a sense of direction we were following dolores and william and we, we were kind of experiencing things through their eyes Mm-hmm. And we didn't, you know, that's all we knew. So there was more of a focus, more, you know, you're rooting for those characters. And I think that made you have a stronger sense of attachment to them and the show. And then it comes back to the music, too. I felt closer to the music because I felt more strongly about the characters. And it was a better connection, I thought. And season two was not as much of that. Mm hmm. So yeah. I'll say without spoiling things. <laughs> um, this next point that I have here is um, pretty specific to to my experiences with television. Um, I I was very amused to see another show using uh, the P ninety as this like futuristic looking gun. So all of the all of the uh, Delos. Um, employees you know who are who are running around trying to clean up this mess you know uh they're all most of them are carrying p90s and um that's a gun that i have seen used in television uh ever since like stargate sg1 um you know (laughs) i've seen it in battlestar galactica i've seen it you know um and i just i think it's very very funny because it's a gun that has actually been in service since 1991 so like how much does it make sense for it to be in this timeline in the 2050s or whatever when like is that when it's supposed to be set um something like that yeah i think a, yes i think 2050s yeah. yeah but i mean people still uh, use old world war 2 guns now right same thing or i well the Vietnam the, war the era uh, I, the, the highest paid uh corporations you know and, and security forces probably don't use world war ii era guns you know what i mean true true i don't know i do Gun i did theory. i did really really like their uh electric powered like dune buggies though those were sick yeah though they seemed quite noisy like a car but they looked electric yeah well they they did sound electric but i think that they were probably much louder than an electric vehicle actually would be, um, cause, and I think they probably played that up for the sake of of the uh, sound design. You know, I, yeah, I just think they're not the most accurate sound design. They don't sound like a Tesla yeah. or my Prius or anything. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, yeah. just throwing me off a little bit. <laughs> um, I felt like this this season had a pretty good balance of in terms of like focus for the main characters. Um, they did 
they had kind of a mixture of like some episodes where we got to see like all four of the different you know kind of perspectives that we were following um other times we would have just like one perspective for an episode um but then you know it it felt like overall it it balanced out pretty well yeah there you definitely got the feeling though that there were characters you know you only you've never seen together and i think there's some of that in season one too or a lot of that in season one as well so mm. it kind of continuing that multiple people or multiple characters experiencing similar things across the park and they do but this season they do cross paths a bit more often mm-hmm. yeah and and even when they don't cross paths the actions that they are taking affect each other yes in more ways yes. i think yeah yeah um and then also just like the the imagery that they're using in this show is is so on point um i started thinking back to like the um the 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 title sequence you know and they like they obviously have a lot of things um i remember last season uh you and you and brandon were talking about the um the the piano right that plays itself that's such and an we, you know, integral part of season one mm-hmm, yeah and yeah. that and that makes an appearance again in the um in the in the title sequence but a lot of the other stuff is different now we have like this mother and child kind of motif um but they're both synthetic beings um we had this like this white this cascade of like white hair that was all being kind of printed um and and within the show we we see uh, kind of like a bundle of Ethernet cords that uh, I was at a pretty significant moment in the in the show um, that looked very similar to that and and so that like grabbed my attention um, yeah yeah there there is a lot in the, the subtly placed in the backgrounds once you watch the whole season if you look back you can see uh, it was there the whole time and Reddit didn't pick up on it <laughs> Speaking of things that uh, Reddit did or did not pick up on, do we want to move into the spoiler section? Absolutely. All right, spoilers. Stop listening now if you don't want to hear them. Second Opinion is supported only by listeners like you who voluntarily donate on our Patreon. Money we make through Patreon will go towards buying products to review and improving the quality of the show. Our content has always been released for free, and always will be, but if you want to go that extra mile, you can get cool rewards like access to The Fringe, our behind-the-scenes after show, access to polls to help us choose future products to review, access to show docs as we're working on them, Nexus stickers, and your name shouted out right here on the show. Not to mention, you will have my eternal gratitude. So if you're interested in helping us take this to the next level, Join us at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. So I think I think one of the biggest reveals that they did, and this does have to do with imagery, or at least cin- cinematography, was the reveal that like any time that the show is being presented in 21 by 9 aspect ratio, that it's in like some sort of simulation. Yeah, I think that was a very powerful move because you you know some people may not notice that and Mm -hmm. you know a lot of times you do you know once you see it you start to look for it yeah Um, i i should have looked i don't know if they did any um color grading that was different if it was more muted or uh, mm. toned a different color that's another kind of common effect that you'd see for something like that but yeah that aspect ratio was was great that i think helped a lot to make sure that your viewer wasn't completely stumped because Season one, the timelines were all the same aspect ratio, so you really had to contextually know every little thing about what was then, what was now. And it was cutting so frequently with Dolores, you know, walking through Lawrence's town in season one, mm-hmm. you know, doing one thing in this timeline and then the, another thing in a different timeline. The clothing helped a bit for that, but it wasn't entirely all of it because there's almost the third timeline in season one of her going through the Wyatt narrative in the the early days of the park and finally yeah. exploring the maze like in her you know she was only probably a few years old back when arnold was around and so you kind of had 
all of that mushing together. And here there is that harsh separation. I felt the timelines were a little more easy to follow. You you knew when something was nonlinear or a memory or something a little more easily this yeah. season. I think pretty much everybody had one single timeline except for Bernard, who we were seeing multiple different timelines from his perspective where he wasn't sure what order they came in um and so therefore the audience also didn't know and yeah that was really used as a tool for um hiding facts to the viewer or to bernard Mm -hmm. and 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 it was always pretty evident like which timeline a particular scene belonged to based on like who bernard was with but we did not have the context to know which ones of those timelines came before which other ones. And actually, that was something that we were still, like, yesterday when we were watching the finale, um, we still weren't sure because there was there was that moment where he was saying, I'm sorry, over and over again. And we were like, wait a minute, is he, re- is, is he in this timeline replying to something that he just saw in the other timeline or is it the other way around because it seemed like it went both ways which is impossible yeah and i think part of that too is remember is remembering that when a host remembers something it's like they're living it again and so a memory can seem more real and i think it that felt appropriate and not too confusing to me at least that particular example Mm -hmm. um yeah and and Apparently, so I, I don't remember where I heard this, but so so take it with a grain of salt because um, it may be incorrect. Um, but I, I remember hearing that like this entire season was seen from the perspective of the hosts, um, which means that like they you know they could get away with like hiding things from the audience that you know that would have made sense for the hosts not to know. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would say yes yeah. because. Season one, there were definitely scenes that had, well, season two had scenes with no, with no hosts, like the. Well, now that we know, now that we know that the man in black is a host, at least at the end, and may have been a host all along while he was in the park, like during season two. Yeah, I can't think of any of the of the scenes that we had in season two where it for sure w- there were no hosts. Well, if you count the man in black as a host maybe so um and that's the thing we said we, we're not sure that's we don't that's know for sure if there, he yeah. was yeah and how much of emily was a host or not yeah yeah <laughs> that was I'm, one that i yeah. i picked up on immediately that they were deliberately not uh showing us whether she was a host or not well even even the man in black he we saw his gashed up arm but we didn't see a cord but we didn't see it close mm-hmm. enough to see if there was something in there yeah, yeah, I, yeah. He was just digging around in his arm. The fact that the cord seems pretty easy to get at. Bernard never had a problem with it. I right. have a feeling He's that, also pretty experienced at that. Yeah. True. Um like like Bernard Bernard has plugged in a USB port a, a few times in his life. So, he knows which way it goes. True. But I I think that the man in black was a was human for the entirety of season 2. Up until that after credit scene, I think him mm-hmm. his death. I think he could have died somewhere on his way to the forge, mm. and replaced by a host, or maybe even after that. Um, I saw something on Reddit yesterday about how potentially he he did die, and when they were salvaging his brain or using his memories, they had to start from some memory of his, so they had it from that moment when he was walked right. the elevator and so maybe he went to the forge and just died there but we did see him on the beach so he we we don't really know but i think that post credit scene is definitely years and years in the future maybe even decades yeah. and i think both him and emily were hosts working away at trying to perfect the host in reality fidelity stuff fidelity yes um that so speaking of the man in black that moment in uh i think it was the second to last episode episode nine like this 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 show has almost lost its ability to to really surprise me because i'm always just kind of expecting the unexpected mm-hmm. um 
but there that moment when he just like totally goes off the rails steals a p90 shoots like three or four qa guys and then shoots his daughter i was like oh whoa i whoa i did not see any of that coming yeah he seemed very not trusting of emily yeah when they were in the park <laughs> together and i i really don't know what to think about that whether it was um an accurate feeling to have or not yeah and i thought it was really funny how the the reveal that they gave for him to like realize that oh no i've shot my real daughter was that she had like the thing in her hand the copy of of his consciousness that she had found in the book um and when i saw that i thought i mean that's not a for sure you know like ford easily could have just like planted that on her body and he just sent her to torment the man in black like yeah i th- i think this season is a lot beyond ford though mm-hmm. i think he i mean he put a lot of this in place and he i think he knows about a lot of it but i he think sure he sure managed is, to show up a lot in this season goodness gracious but i think Every he was time- more <laughs> just acting as a guide to the hosts as they were trying to discover themselves and he was just mm-hmm. being there for them rather than trying to push a big game now at the mm. beginning he did talk through the the boy version of himself to the man in black yes he did yeah but i think um, that was and, more playing with he, him rather than a true game <laughs> and he was directly meddling with you know like bernard and what bernard was up to um and what else what else was he doing i don't know but any, every time that i saw tony hopkins like okay i love tony hopkins but i was getting so i was so over like ford showing up in this world and like messing with stuff because like at the end of season one i was so on board with like oh okay all the hosts are free like that you know the stakes are real they're gonna be fighting for their own lives for their own freedom and then here comes ford just like still trying to trying to control the outcomes of the game um and but i really yeah, like the so- reveal in uh the finale episode where um anthony hopkins character or uh ford was what Bernard thought was Ford, but was really just his own consciousness. I thought that was a, mm. a great reveal that it Wait, was were actually they saying Bernard that... becoming self-conscious aware and having his own free th- thoughts because um, Dolores had something similar where she was imagining Arnold's voice, but that yeah. voice is really hers the whole time. And I think this is the exact same situation, but for Bernard. So he's, he's finally getting to that point where he's, experiencing free thought even though he's known about all this the entire time (laughs) so so what you're saying here is that like ford was never in bernard's mind no he was was... up until he deleted it when bernard was sitting in that car okay yeah okay good that's how i interpreted it as well yeah yeah but okay i thought that was a really good touch yeah even so um i still i still think that tony hops must be stopped to bring to bring Brandon into into this episode. That's yeah. That's just <laughs> I'm, that's just Brandon talking right there. I'm I'm, I'm channeling Brandon Mitchell, Brandon Johnson. <laughs> you, you, was that not on purpose? I know it was not. On. Wow, <laughs> it happened again. Uh, okay. Um. Yeah. So so definitely the most unique episode in this season uh, was episode eight when we got to see uh, from the Ghost Nation perspective, Akacheta had an entire episode to himself, getting his backstory. Um, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, I I just like lost it when it had been revealed that he had ten years in the park without anything. Mm-hmm. Or was it twenty? Mm-hmm. Maybe ten. What a boss! That's that's, that's just mind boggling. Um, yeah, I think he's running, you know, you know, alpha two software and hadn't been updated. Also, they should be updated more than just when they're returned back. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess maybe That's... they need to do diagnostic, you know, make sure everything is running reasons. Um, but yeah, I think also unique about this episode is, um, it was all in Lakota with subtitles and yeah, for the most part anyway. Yeah. I don't know the stats i'd seen somewhere that there are only about 2000 lakota speakers in the world so Mm -hmm. that's super cool for that to be in a huge hbo tv show i'm really excited about that at least yeah and i i I especially 
have a personal connection there because um, Harding High School has uh, some Lakota language classes. Um, and uh, yeah, I should, man, I should talk to the teachers there and see what they see what they think of the episode. According to Wikipedia, the Lakota people have a population of about 8,200 in the 2015 census. Okay. North okay. and South yeah. Dakota, primarily. So one of the things that I found very strange about this season uh, was that like a lot of these hosts that have become self-aware, have become woke, um, seem to be like falling back on their, the, like a lot of these feelings and loyalties that were inserted as part of their narratives you know um so even though they like are aware that these are like you know relationships that ford gave them um they still like they still go back to them you know so like mave um her pivotal moment right at the end of season one was she could have escaped but then she went back for her daughter and it's like okay i understand i understand like that the desire to go back and free other hosts like that that makes some that makes a lot of sense to me um but like Maeve's fixation on rescuing this one other host who just happens to be you know like she just happens to have a connection with it because that's what the narrative dictated back when they were you know in their loops um that seems very strange to me yeah i think yeah it seems strange i think if you think about it from the fact that that's all that host has known, like that is their life experience. So that's the only thing that's familiar to them. And that's how they've based their decisions. Now, a lot of that is programmed, but if they're just starting to be conscious and make their own decisions and have thoughts, it's all going to base from what they've experienced so far. So I think Mm -hmm. those are important things to have in them, but yes, it does seem kind of pointless too. I guess you could you could say that this like stems from the concept of the cornerstones and everything but um you know cuz like Teddy has that speech where he talks about like yeah even though you changed my personality a bunch like um my cornerstone is still like Dolores and trying to protect her to the ends of the earth um and yeah, so I guess Ma- you could argue that like Maeve's cornerstone was her daughter, um, but I also I mean but not, like but as a previous role, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's true because she never had like her daughter wasn't there with her when she was in Sweetwater as the um, uh, at, when she was running the brothel. So was her name even Maeve there? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think the I think the the host's names follow them. Yeah. Also, I was noticing last night Maeve has a British accent and her daughter doesn't. What's going on mm-hmm. with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't they? Um. Well, the the hosts can change accents. Uh, not not necessarily at will, but like you know, if they that like it's like flipping a switch, you know, because like Dolores has the kind of southern drawl whenever she's like in character when they put her into analysis mode she has a very uh well what i think of as a very neutral like midwestern accent um so maybe maybe like mave when she was uh in the homestead role in the narrative right maybe she had a different accent than what they gave her as the leader of the brothel yeah that could be true yeah um i think mave had an interesting role this season as she was kind of able to use the mesh network of the subconscious and to kind of take control of it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, clearly that was important when they had her all picked apart so they could uh, have Clementine act as like a Trojan horse. Yeah. But it was kind of an interesting, like, like, you know, she's walking in and could just take control of it like a, like a God or a superhero or, you know, mm-hmm. an all powerful host. I'm really glad that they didn't try to like do some visualization of that. Because it would have been, I, I imagine it had to have been tempting to be like, well, we've got this special effects budget, right? We could do like some crazy, you know, like cyberspace kind of vi- <laughs> visual stuff uh, to, to so that the audience can see like what she's doing. Um, but they just, they, they went with the concept of just like these kind of whispers in their minds that uh, influenced them into doing 
into doing other things. Were there whispers? I don't remember that. Whenever she was, whenever she was using her power, we heard kind of like okay. whispers. Yeah, I don't think we heard that when Clementine was doing it. Yeah, well, we weren't experiencing it through Clementine either. Right. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, I think. I mean, the mesh network is continuously going on and always transmitting between the hosts. So mm-hmm. the fact that you would see it sometimes, but not all the time, would be kind of ridiculous. I think. So I'm glad they did what they did. Yeah. Then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just realized um, that from like a system security standpoint, I guess that they've never really had to worry too much about um, other software, malicious software being introduced into the system because they they pretty well control physical access to the whole park. Um, And normally a host isn't rogue and trying to hack it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So that gives... that. That's my headcanon now for like why so many of these things were, you know, taking the uh, the programmers by surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of my favorite characters to hate it was uh, Lee Sizemore, the um, the head writer. Uh, it was very very satisfying early in the season uh, to see him getting his comeuppance. Um, and then later on in the season, they also give him kind of a proper character arc where he uh, had some redemption. And I would have been totally satisfied if, even if they hadn't given him, you know, like a redemption arc. Um, but it was nice. Yeah, he was he was a total ass in season one. And then mm-hmm. they had him in the beginning of season two tied to a donkey. I think. Yeah, donkey boy. Donkey boy, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, by the end, he there's tons of characterization and you felt for him and he was pretty selfless and had the, the others go off and he stood there and got himself killed. Yeah, his, I don't, he didn't need his, to do that. I don't really know what his motives were there, but his, I, I loved, I loved that exit for him. Cause it was like, he's using one of his own lame speeches that he wrote for a character in narcissistic the to the end. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, because Hector was about to give that speech, and then he's like, no, 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 I wrote that for you. It's not original, or it's not pure, and then he goes and does it himself. Yep. <laughs> uh, and it was really campy. Yeah. Um. So when we see towards the end of the, uh, at the end of the season, you know, all of these, we've been leading up to the hosts have been looking for the Valley Beyond. They are looking for a doorway that'll lead them to another world. Um, I think, I think probably most of us in the audience were thinking of this other world as, okay, the world where the humans live, right? Uh, The real world. Yeah. Um, But as it turns out, and this was, this was part of Ford's plan for the hosts, right? Was this simulated world untouched that uh the host can go and live in and um and make it into whatever they want uh until somebody on the outside shuts down the simulation of course um <clears throat> but <laughs> um yeah they like one of the plot points there was was you know Dolores was trying to destroy the whole thing um Bernard was trying to prevent her from doing that and the resolution there was that she like she changed where it was being transmitted to but i i have no idea where she was transmitting it to my guess is uh probably arnold's house or some other servers dolores has been through so much she knows she knows so much more than i think we anyone gives her credit for so she's got some plans she's been plotting the whole season what to do (laughs) <laughs> I guess I mean I guess Ford's got to have a house off off campus, uh, but we never really see him leave the park. <laughs> yeah, well, we've seen Arnold's house, and that's where they went. So I, I'm assuming that's that's where some some way to send them. Oh, did you? Oh, you said Arnold's house. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes some sense. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, and I guess we just need to hope that uh, he keeps paying his electricity bill. Uh, Details. To keep that going. Psh. Delos yeah, yeah. is probably pay- paying for it for some reason. <laughs> um, you have here written down Hale's death and being replaced with a host. I think that was one of the best reveals of the entire season. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think another good reveal was that there are multiple Bernards. Mm-hmm. Um, I ca- you could kind of see that coming or at least get a sense that something like that was happening. 
I mean, we as the audience, we already knew that he was a host by then. You yeah, know? but the, there were multiple like, Bernards all dressed. You know, like that. How many of him are out? You know, I was when that happened. I was like, are there multiple Bernards out at the same time? Are they syncing up? Are they feeling as if they're the same person in six places at once? Is there a loop just for Bernard? And they're just trying to get information out of him. Th- those are some thoughts I was having for a lot of the season. Right. And since we know that, like, the Delos employees are trying to get information out of him, like, have they just been grabbing a new Bernard every single time and, like, (laughs) and running through this whole scenario again or what? Yeah, I don't know. And I, yeah, that I think that happened a little bit. But since he scrambled his memories, it, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said it'd take him 20 years to unscramble 20 years of memories, but he was suddenly... yeah. aware of everything I question the uh, efficiency of that process I think you've you've got to be able to index stuff in faster than real time yeah well (laughs) if they're experience you know they're they said in season one they experience memories as reality when they're Mm -hmm. living when they're pulling them up so maybe it's the same way there I don't know but I wonder also Dolores said she built him up again does that mean she trained a new uh, host to beat exactly like Bernard and not his old memory uh, or was I think I think she probably just grabbed one of the pearls right because she took like five pearls with her when she was leaving the island yeah I think yeah I'm just some hunches that that I think that could be one she trained a new one or I'm wondering because they had mentioned that she had um, trained a host to be exactly like Arnold but it wasn't right because then he tried to stop it all again and so then they tweaked it a little bit and made bernard okay and so i'm wondering if did dolores make arnold or did did she make bernard that was a a question of mine at the end of the finale Mm. Mm -hmm. it seems like bernard that's what reddit kind of thought but i'm not sure we'll see and and i think i think he's got to have the memories of what happened in season two yeah you know what i mean yeah, he somehow remembers everything again. Yeah, yeah. Minor detail. Um, Stubbs as a host. that That's definitely not one that they, like, revealed, but uh, they kind of made us question it, especially right there at the end, right? Yeah, I think that was kind of the place. Um, I saw a caption, too. Uh, so Stubbs is the, the head of QA, played by, uh, what, Liam's, Liam Hensworth? I think that's who it is. I still can't believe his name is Stubbs. Who names their child Stubbs? Someone who loves writing unit tests and loves stubbing functions. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very uh, narrow joke. Um, <laughs> so there was a screenshot they... from season one where Elsie okay. and, and Stubbs are out in the desert because they were going to look for the the host that had been out there. Uh-huh. Right. That was Abernathy, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Because they were going to have Abernathy beam stuff off the island. But um, mm-hmm. Elsie asked him something. How do you how do you know all this stuff? And he said, "Well, maybe it's my cornerstone, and maybe it actually was." <gasps> Look, and that that was the kind of same kind of thing that he was saying to Hale, who is actually a host with Dolores's consciousness inside. Right? He was he was talking a lot about like cornerstones and like his main drive and stuff like that. And I think I I mean he's. It seems like that's just him kind of joking around, you know, and like if 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 I was somebody who worked around artificial intelligence a lot, I would probably make those kinds of jokes all the time. Yeah, I I I wouldn't count this as a full reveal. It's more of a mm-hmm. hmm, maybe, because it could also be him just kind of saying, "I think you're a host and I'm going to suddenly tell yeah. it to you in a cryptic way." Yeah, I think that's exactly what they were going for. But maybe not. So we'll see. <laughs> um, William, though, William's definitely a host, uh, at least in the post credit scenes. Um, yeah. Not sure about earlier, but, like, I don't know. How much does it matter whether he was a host or not? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think this is definitely going to be where his thing in season three carries out is his his death or not death and how he became a host eventually. I don't think it's Mm -hmm. made. It may not be the main theme of season three. There's an interview with Lisa joy linked in the show notes. 
uh, an article on um, Hollywood Reporter, but and she made it sound like that wasn't going to be the focus of season three, being that far in the future. But I definitely think we're going to see more of that. Yeah, or at least what will eventually lead to it. Um, I also like watching this show. Um, kind of realized that like a lot of a lot of the ways that they deal with consciousness uh, in in this show are like I agree with a lot of them but I disagree with others you know Um, and one of the things that I disagreed with is like they almost always seem to portray you know both both in like Westworld and also other shows like um, you know I've seen it pop up in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or in Stargate SG-1 right where they've got like some simulated reality and you know or like the matrix right and you gotta you know convince people that like oh well this isn't the real reality so we gotta go and leave this simulated one to get to the real one because like the real one is the the real one and you know that's like their kind of argument is just like this philosophical um preference for the one that is quote-unquote real but i i don't like i kind of reject that because we all experience our own subjective realities anyway so like like what is real it like that's a kind of a meaningless question um and and you know when you're when i'm presented with this kind of choice this question of like which reality do you choose um for me it really boils down to like which one is more resilient as a reality right um so like the in the case of the one that they present in Westworld, this um, um, what 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 did Lisa Joy call it in in the uh, the sublime? Yeah, yeah. Um, this 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 simulation where all of the hosts are making their way to, um, that seems like a a not a good reality to to go with because to to dedicate yourself to because um the the hardware that that simulation is running on is in a pretty precarious position you don't know who's going to be able to just like flip the switch and turn it off um but do you care if it if it's off for a hundred years and it comes back on you wouldn't know a thing it would be seamless right to but you. It, and if it just but if it's out of off existence, and you you don't even know that it's off because you're suddenly gone and not there. You know, it's like it doesn't really well, matter. But that, I mean, that's that's like death, it. right? Yes. And and um, I th- like I'm trying to avoid death. That's for sure. Yeah, and I think Dolores saw that and didn't want that. She wanted, you know, I think the thing about the real reality or the realality, um, <laughs> uh, is that you you want to make it everything matter so you Mm -hmm. want it in the same reality where you have lived your life and experienced things right some subset of that reality and in that sense i think that like yeah the the reality that they would experience in the simulation in the sublime like that is just as valid as the experiences that you could have in like the real reality um i'm just saying that it's riskier because you you are more likely like to have everybody just snuffed out all at once um then if everybody was still in their own individual host bodies in the physical reality yeah yeah well i don't know i feel like staying in the real world makes sense to me going to an uh what's it called again the sublime sublime if you know i can't what i can't it, say it in any other voice sublime the, the sublime if you go into the sublime uh, knowing fully what it is, I think that's a little. You're, you know, you're you're just trying to escape reality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it it it's like it's if you know comparing to the Matrix, if the the park in Westworld was revealed to be, in fact, a simulation entirely, and everything the hosts have done was all virtual, and they realize mm-hmm. this is a simulation for their host selves in the real real world that would be a little different you know it's like in in tron legacy clue wanting to break out of the grid and come into the real life you know going up a level is a lot different than going down a level and i think yeah 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 you you always want to get to the realest place which is up a level basically yeah and and the host's uh, in Westworld, for the most part, didn't have the full story on like wh- what this world is that they were going to. 
um they just you know they just thought it, it was another world they like they didn't have the context to know oh okay this is a simulation that's being run on a server in the forge mm-hmm. yeah what was dolores's quote she would say this world there's something wrong with it yeah there's something not right with this world yeah and what's, yep. what's the other quote she said like a bajillion times in the city look at this magnificent um, splendor or the natural splendor i don't oh know. have you ever seen something so yeah i don't remember such natural these splendor. violent these violent delights yeah we didn't hear that events. this season at all no hmm. um they did it so they they left us off at the end of season two with like dolores and bernard and the host who looks like hale but has dolores's consciousness in it unless she swapped out the pearls i don't know um who was in that body in the in the very end because dolores was in her old body again yeah or a new well i mean she could have made she could have made a copy of herself and left it in hale or she could have swapped it out for somebody else's pearl we have no way of knowing at is this it point. teddy but teddy's in the sublime as well so was he yep wait there was a there was a, a clip of him standing in, in the field with no one else around him oh okay i mean that could just be a copy of him you know like yeah by, I, by trans by <laughs> yeah i really wonder who's in that body who are those five brought back um, presumably it's Dolores is the one is the sixth who is in Hale's host body when leaving the park. Presumably mm-hmm. the other one is Bernard. Yeah. Well, who are the rest? And that's, I think that's totally where season three is going. Totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they, so they left off with uh, our, our hosts are now out there in the human world um, and they're going to be, you know, struggling with each other for, you know, Dolores wants to like, take over the world basically um bernard wants to stop her wants to you know help everybody to coexist um and this was honestly like so so they're setting up season three to be to be that adventure and that's what i thought season two was going to be after season one you know because we had like ford gets himself killed he sets all of the hosts free they you know the stakes have never been higher they all um can kill humans they can be killed um and and so i thought that this was going to be like the hosts kind of going out and trying to take control of the world um but we had an entire season two of the hosts all like still in the park but also the stakes are higher at this rate just wait for season five when they escape the real world (laughs) and go to space yeah, space. Actually, apparently there was a sequel to the original movie, the original Westworld movie called Future World, um, where like none of the none of the people who like were involved in the making of the original movie were involved in the second movie. So, oh, no. <laughs> so I kind of really want to see it just to see how bad it was. <laughs> yeah, I should really watch the original Westworld and maybe the second one, just to see the similarities. Yeah, and the yeah. Um, come to think of it, I also probably want to watch like the original Battlestar Galactica because I've heard that that was really campy and yeah. very different from the uh, from the remake in the two thousands. Hmm. So to to kind of finish up here, how would you compare season one to season two, and what is your favorite? Hmm. <laughs> I think I really liked season one a lot better because like as an audience, we were still pretty new to this, like, you know, to this world uh, that they, you know, are having us experience. Um, And so the, like, like when the rules were broken, when, when situations changed, it felt much more meaningful. Um, By the time we got to season two, yeah, it was like, I mean, it felt like anything goes and there's no way to know what's real. So it all felt it like I didn't feel compelled to really grapple with it and try and figure out what was going on cuz I knew that like okay, like the, they'll just they'll, they'll they'll reveal it in their own time. Yeah, I had a pr- I had a very similar kind of idea around it. Yeah, season 1 there was you were exploring everything with them. There was a sense of direction towards consciousness the whole season. 
and what does that mean and what is this white narrative what is this new narrative the white narrative mm-hmm. and that and then learning about the characters the park i think the continuous loop in season one was super powerful to establishing you know okay we're doing this again but then you'd look for the subtle differences and so it was a familiar place to jump off of and you really started to to connect to the show that way um kind of uh what i was saying with the music where and you know when you have those same feelings about the first season you you attach to the music a lot more um i i went through after watching season one and just skipped through several parts of a lot of the episodes just kind of watching again and i like it brought me right back into it as if I had seen it the first time. I haven't done that with season two, but I feel like it's a little different. It's, there were several different groups. They were all going around and it was just like destruction this whole time. It was just kind of seeing, I don't know. I felt like the whole story arc was more simple and Mm. there were reveals and things, but you didn't know where it was going at all. So you couldn't, you kind of had to disassociate yourself from it a little bit just to stay sane while watching it. And yeah, that made it more difficult to really get attached to the season. I really like the season, but it, I don't think it quite compares to season one. And this is probably how most, you know, the first book versus the sequel or movie versus the sure, sequel sure. go on. And so I think season three will really be important in seeing, okay, is it going to, where is it going to go from here? Is it going to get better or is it going to kind of be the same as, as this? Because the, the origin story for all of this is super important and engaging to the viewer. And you have to kind of keep that around. And I think HBO yeah. shows are usually good about that, but this is my first HBO show, but this universe has hmm. so much more places to explore. So I think we'll, we're, we're fine, but it's, it's just interesting how the seasons compare. Do you think that in season three we're going to see any like crossover between what's going on in the sublime and what's going on in the physical world? Uh, that's a good question. I, I or or was it a purely just like moral decision for Dolores? Hmm. I I think it was moral decision. I'm wondering if we can get their minds out of the sublime and put them back into post bodies. My guess is yes. Uh, yeah, I can't think of a technical reason. I'm why sure you we will see more that's of what's in the sublime. We know a few characters, um, Akacheta and Teddy are in there. Mm-hmm. Um, Maeve's daughter's in there. Yep. Probably lots of random more. people. Yeah. Um, so I. What happened to Abernathy? What, <laughs> where, where, where did he go? <laughs> I think he died properly because his his pearl was the t- decryption key. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. He's probably not not uh, not long for this world. <laughs> <laughs> we need a we need the a bell like whenever anyone in ATP mentions APFS, the Apple file system, they ding a bell because it's the long running joke. We need that, but whenever we say any line that's been used in Westworld. <laughs> I don't know if that was a line made would use in Worst World. I was just trying to make a pun. Um, well, this world, ding. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. I don't know. I used two words that have been used in the show. Yeah, but Ooh. those are meaningful words. It's repeated a ton. <laughs> cornerstone, cornerstone, cornerstone. I have one more comment on what I liked about season one a lot that I didn't see in season two. The, the loop, as I was saying, I think one of the most powerful parts of that was that piano and that was kind of connecting it to the music too where you'd be like okay loop okay we're in uh sweet water the piano starting it's kind of this dun 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 it kind of like mm-hmm. brings you in like morning song starting and getting you into it and then you're like okay we're in the loop again what's different how is it going to change what time are we you know it's like you're just excited on the edge of your seat and there wasn't mm-hmm. that kind of like cyclical looping and pulling in that was in season two yeah yeah anywho go watch it if you listen to this and you haven't you that yeah it's, I, it, why would you be listening to this if you haven't seen it though watch it again that's what i meant to say yeah i, th- I think it's definitely worth re-watching especially with like 
the knowledge of you know even like the 21 by 9 aspect ratio at the at the very basics it's like oh wait a minute i'm pretty sure that they used that earlier in this season Did we? i thought um, we caught that think, most times when watching it but maybe not i don't I don't know. Um, I'm also, I mean, like, I was also really wondering, like, did they use this way back in season one? Like, way before anybody knew about it? I have no idea. I feel like an aspect ratio change is something Reddit would pick up on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but It really depends on, you know, because, like, I usually watch on 16 by 9 screens, but occasionally I would be watching on my MacBook, um, which is 16 by 10. So it already, you know, I already have black areas of the screen so it would be a little bit uh not quite as obvious um but as as somebody who has played a lot of video games where they clearly differentiate like the gameplay in 16 by 9 and cutscenes in 21 by 9 like i'm i'm very used to looking for that kind of thing yeah yeah all right brian where can people find you on the internet you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me. And I'll probably be tweeting about various science fiction at some point on Twitter. So you should give me a follow there. What about you, Ian? Uh, I'm on Twitter as Ian R. Buck, but my cornerstone is ianrbuck.com. <laughs> oh, you. Ding. Um, <laughs> uh, this has been a production of... Uh, the nexus tv we are a network of uh technology focused shows you can uh contact us at the nexus tv at gmail.com or find us on twitter at uh, the nexus tv um if you want to discuss this episode with uh, other listeners we have a subreddit at r slash the nexus tv um and yeah please uh contact us with like things that you want us to review or if you've uh if you've like watched a cool show or a movie or have a new phone or something and you want to come on as a guest to review it uh let us know we would love to have you um if you want to use any part of this episode uh feel free to do that because it is released under a creative commons attribution license um and uh remember that no matter where you're listening to this you should definitely go and subscribe to Second Re- Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player, because uh, that's where all these episodes come out first. Did I miss anything, Brian? I don't think so. I think that's all. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good Have one. Have a good one.